Hi, this is Joe Chambers. Welcome to Musicians Hall of Fame Backstage. Today's guest is Country Music Hall of Fame inductee and multi-Grammy winning Emmylou Harris. This is part one of a two-part interview. Hope you enjoy it. If you do, be sure to hit like, subscribe, and the notification bell so you don't miss any of our new content. And for those of you who can help, we now have a Patreon account. Once again, Emmylou Harris. Welcome back to Musicians Hall of Fame backstage with Emmy Lou Harris. Emmy, thank you again so much for coming. Oh, I'm glad to. I always love to visit the Musicians Hall of Fame, Joe, so I'm happy to be here. Thanks. Um, so, as always, we always want to know how did you get started? What made you want to be a musician? Right. Was it Somebody in your family was a musician already? Or did just... Well, no, it just kind of came out of nowhere. And in fact, uh, apparently people thought I was musical. I mean, I could carry a tune and I did a few things in like kindergarten. I sang something or something. And so they thought I should learn piano. I, I just didn't relate to the piano. I hated, I didn't have a knack for it. I, I didn't like rehearsing. And then when I got into, um, High school, um, I was uh, in the marching band uh, and the and the uh, uh, orchestra, playing the saxophone, the alto saxophone. Uh, but once again, I was just doing it like any other, like you take math or you take history. You know, there was no uh, emotion there. And then um, in high school, uh, around sixty three, sixty four, there was. Um, a folk revival, folk music revival. And um, I was living in Woodbridge, Virginia. My, my father was, uh, which is about 25 miles south of Washington, D.C. My father was stationed in Quantico uh, in the Marine Corps. And I could get this station from um, uh, WAMU from American University. This wonderful disc jockey named Dick Seary who played folk music. and. There was just something about that music that I'd never, ever wanted to really play an instrument, and I wanted a guitar. And my grandfather bought me a $30 K from a pawn shop in Birmingham, Alabama. That's where they lived. Um, and uh, even though it was a very difficult to play, it was a uh, had very high action, $30 K, you can imagine. But I didn't know the difference. I didn't know that it wasn't supposed to be difficult to play and make your fingers bleed. And so I just would sit around and learn everything I could. I had nobody to teach me anything. Uh, but I managed to learn three chords, which is about all I still know. Um, but there was something about, I think the lyrics had a lot to do with it. There were story songs. I'm still kind of drawn to that. Um, it, it, it got me into music uh, the way all those other instruments. I think it's because I could accompany myself singing. Can't do that on a saxophone. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess that was it. I started actually and, and singing songs that meant something to me, um, those story songs, even though, you know, a lot of those folk songs have nothing to do with be your own particular history at the age of 16. But there's something about the human condition in a good song that even if you haven't experienced yet, I think it resonates. It resonates somewhere that you have a certain barometer that you know that something is true, even if maybe you hadn't, haven't had actual experience with it. So, so that was uh, where music became a very, very important in my life, even though I... I wanted to be an actress at that point. I was going to go to school to study drama. Um, music quickly took over. Folk music quickly took over, though. Do you still have your $30 harmony? I do. <laughs> I still, I actually still have that uh, $30 K. Um, really? Yeah. Well, is, it, is it not in a museum anywhere? I think uh, it was in the, the Country Music Hall of Fame uh, 
uh, had it when they did that display on me. You want it? Yeah, <laughs> I think it'd be great. Um, Why not? Okay, well, it's a deal. <laughs> I, I, so Crocker, he gave me his first. I mean, this thing is like, I mean, it's like got a neck like a baseball bat, you know. I mean, so, it's that. I don't know how I, but I actually performed on it for a while. I mean, y you know, maybe at high school. I actually, um, uh, with babysitting money and uh, help from my parents, I actually bought um, a Gibson J50, which is, for the money, is still maybe one of the best guitars you can have. And uh, that was the guitar that I took to college with me. But, you know, my mother kept that $30 K, and I, I still have it. Cropper's dad, the last thing he bought him was, um, and I don't even know how, to, what model it is, but it's a small parlor style Gibson. Yeah. That, that's what he learned on. That's how. That yeah, whole, but it know, was still a Gibson. It was still a this Gibson. This was a, and not like K. I mean, I've I've heard that the K uh, acoustic basses are really great. Yeah. You know, and I'm sure that maybe there's some, and of course this means uh, it's sentimental to me because my grandfather. Yeah. Uh, you know, bought it for me at a pawn shop. Because we didn't know what we were looking for. <laughs> no, you know, that's, that, that story is so, runs, runs through so many people's stories is because they had the same thing. They had, yeah. they had a, a K or Silvertone or something like that. And the, um, the action was so high, they couldn't, they literally bled, you know. They, well, you know. And, and it should have been probably a slide guitar. <laughs> Yeah. Is for a slide. It's not that high. I, I exaggerate a little bit, but it was pretty difficult. So you were born in Birmingham, right? I was born in, my mother's from Birmingham. Uh, and uh, my father, uh, well, they traveled all over. He was born in New Jersey, but um, um, they, uh, they met during World War II. He was in officer training school in Pensacola, and she was on a... Um, um, just an outing with a couple of girlfriends uh, from Birmingham. Everybody went to Pensacola, and they met. Uh, it was love at first sight. They didn't know a thing about each other. And they eloped, and here I am. So uh, what got you from like, Birmingham to, what was your next step, to California? Or? No, no, there's so much in between. Because my father, you know, being the Marine Corps, uh, we were at Cherry Point and Camp Lejeune, North Carolina, and I went to college in North Carolina. I, um, I ended up going to Virginia. I quit school when I realized I didn't really want to be an actress, and I wasn't very good at it, but I loved singing. And so um, I, I made a foray to Virginia Beach to, uh, to work to earn money to go to New York, uh, trying to be Joan Baez. I ended up being a waitress. And uh, uh, eventually uh, ended up in, in D.C. My, by that time, my parents had uh, uh, moved to Maryland, where um, he, my father had, left the, had retired from the Marine Corps. And he had family in Maryland, in the, that area between D.C. and Baltimore, a, an, ag a, an agricultural area. Uh, before it got really over overdeveloped, they had a nice little house there, and um, I had had uh, um, my first marriage had failed, and I had a, a child, a daughter, and I just basically went home to try to figure out what to do. I didn't think music was. Fortunately, there was a wonderful uh, musical um, family happening in Washington D.C., and through friends there. Uh, Bill and Taffy Danoff, uh, who wrote um, Take Me Home Country Roads with John Denver. I got to know them before they, they wrote that song, and they were playing in the local clubs there. They got me work there. and uh, Was that where you first performed in front of anybody? Oh, no. I'd been performing in Virginia Beach. I'd been performing in New York. Uh, did you do the village thing? Oh, yeah. I did the village, the village thing. I started in the basket houses, and... Uh, I ended up being kind of the house opener for Gertie's Folk City. I survived on $100 a week. Back then, you could do that. Mm -hmm. You know, rent was, I had, had a cheap apartment, and it uh, didn't take much to get by. And that's where you really get your chops, playing for people that didn't come to hear you. Right. But in a place that, that people would listen. I've also played places where people don't listen. Mm -hmm. But I think that's important, too. Yeah. I mean, you got to hold your own. And, and not get your feelings hurt if, 
you know, nobody's listening to you. That's as important as the times when you've got everybody's attention. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I had a lot under my belt at the, uh, you know, ripe old age of 23 or 24. And uh, it, it was, uh, I met Graham and um, uh, when he, he came to that area, that's how everything kind of took off from me from that point. How did you meet Graham? Um, the burritos uh, had, were playing in, in, without Graham. You see, he had left them. They were playing in, um, uh, they were playing at a, uh, the, the, the cool club uh, uh, in Georgetown, the cellar door. Uh, they came into where I was playing to get a drink after their show and heard me uh, and I was doing like one country song, <laughs> almost for a joke. Uh, it wasn't God who made Honky Tonk's Angels. And they actually um, thought, you know, I might have something. And I sat in with them one night while they were at the cellar door. Um, they moved on to a concert a few days later up in Baltimore. And it just so happened that Brian, uh, that, um, that Graham and uh, uh, Gretchen uh, his young wife, his new wife, had come in uh, and sat in, and uh, in the in conversation after the show that um, Chris Hillman and Graham were having, uh, Graham said he was looking for a girl singer. I mean, this all sounds incredible. And uh, they remembered me. They didn't remember my name, and they didn't remember my. They didn't have my phone number, but. There was a young woman working for the produ for the producer of that concert backstage who babysat for my young daughter, and she knew they were talking about me, and so <laughs> she gave she gave uh, Graham my phone number, and he called me the next day. Isn't that crazy? It's crazy. It was meant to be. Well, you 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 would have to say that, wouldn't you? So, so that's why I'm here tonight talking to you, yeah. Joe, if I hadn't been a, a single mother. <laughs> well, hey, we're going to take a break, and we'll be right back. Hey, Musicians Hall of Fame and Museum Backstage fans. Check out our new backstage gear. From T-shirts to coffee mugs, we've got you covered. Not yet a fan? Check out our YouTube channel and enjoy some intimate conversations with the world's best musicians. Welcome back to Musicians Hall of Fame with Amy Lou Harris. So, the... That was an incredible story. I mean, what happened after after you guys hooked up? You know? Well, I mean, you know, he we made the records and we went on a road together, and Graham died. You know, uh, one of those terrible fatalities. I mean, he was only twenty six and died of, died of a drug overdose. So I was kind of left. He had gotten me all interested in loving country music and. So I went from being a folk singer, you know, thinking that drum, drums, you know, were evil and to loving being, you know, having a band. And um, I put a little band together in D.C. because um, uh, I, I knew some musicians there. The fellow who had played ba bass for me in my, um, in my little folk trio, Tom Guidera, um, we were actually a couple at the time. We were, we were living together and playing music together. And he was incredibly helpful. We, we, he knew I needed to put a band together, so he was going to play bass, and we, 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 we gleaned from, from the local musicians a, a pretty good little band that we called Angel Band and just started playing clubs. Um, and um, my Graham's manager, uh, Eddie Tickner, while... Graham was still alive, and while I was on the road with them, uh, Eddie had, uh, we had decided that Eddie would manage me. And at some point, I thought, I'll probably make a record on my own. Um, but that was something put, I, I was really, I was so intense on learning country music and singing with Graham and the duets and everything. Um, I felt like it was this beginning of where I was going. But, of course, when Graham died, it, it just was a... a Re, you know, rethinking everything. Um, but but Eddie uh, Eddie got in touch with um, uh, Mary Martin, who was um, head of A and R at uh, Warner Brothers, which was Graham's uh, Graham's label. 
and brought her to hear me, and she liked what she heard. Well, she's a Canadian, and uh, she was great pals with Brian O'Hearn, another Canadian who was having great success with Anne Murray. And uh, so um, a team was kind of put together. You know, she put, put Brian and I together. Uh, and Eddie, and because I had uh, a, a producer with track record who wanted to produce me, that is what led to me being able to get my own record contract, you see. Was Mary located here in Nashville uh, at that time? Well, no, she, it took her a long time to get to Nashville. She's here now. But uh, no, uh, Mary was in New York. Uh, and, uh, and then she eventually uh, uh, moved out to LA. It, uh, but then she's like a lot of us that did that East Coast, uh, West Coast, and then Nashville. We, we've ended up here in Nashville. It's like there's this magnetic force that has brought us all here. Um, so really, I was so lucky because I, I really, looking back on it, I think that, that Brian was the one producer who could have taken me at where I was at that point, trying to figure out what I wanted to do. I discovered this love of country music, but I had kind of a folk voice, and I was still, in, in, to me, had so much to learn without my sort of teacher, Graham. Uh, but so wanted to continue on somehow on this road. Uh, and Brian uh, was just the perfect person to, to, to guide me and give me that confidence in the studio, because it's totally different making a record in the studio from singing live. Mm -hmm. I mean, singing live, I was, I was getting pretty confident with that, you know, uh, so with fronting my own band, because I had a great little band and um, you just have to go out and play. Uh, and, um, but making a record, I mean, a record like that, because I'd done the records with Graham, but I was, there's no pressure. I was a harmony singer, you know, all the pressure was on Graham. And so um, it was a perfect uh, place for me to be an apprentice, so to speak. But now, you know, it, it was on me and, uh, Brian has a way as a producer, he says he's invisible. And he is in a way, but somehow you know that he sees the whole picture. And he picks up on every little thing that's going on. And you also know that if, if anything starts to go awry, that he's gonna be there to set, set it right. Um, I was just so lucky to be able to work with someone in the beginning of my career that way. And then, uh, have the uh, record company of uh, Warner Reprise back then, and a wonderful manager, uh, Eddie Tickner, between Eddie and Brian. Uh, and um, after the record came out, and it did better than I expected or anyone. I don't mean it was a million seller, but back then record companies really paid attention to when maybe some, there was something going on over here that was unusual. Um, they were able to get the record company to pay for Elvis Presley's, basically a core from Elvis Presley's band to go out with me. Uh, Glenn D. Harden, James Burton, um, were mainly it, Emery Gordy, who was a fantastic bass player. So I had some of the best musicians in the world in my band. Um, and then we had a great drummer, John Ware. Uh, Hank DeVito was one of the young, young uh, steel players. He he was one of those uh, of my generation who started on the Telecaster, and after uh, Sweetheart of the Rodeo or or uh, or you know the first Burrito album came out, mm -hmm. a lot of those 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 young uh, players thought, "What is this instrument, the pedal steel?" And uh, that was Hank, and um, I was able to find Hank and and. Uh, a real important piece too was Rodney Crowell. Yeah. And that was because of Brian, because Brian had signed him to a publishing deal. And um, that's how I met Rodney, and that's how he ended up in my band. It was, a, it was like the stars aligned, the personalities of all of us and what we were doing at that time. And we were able to do it at a time when 
nobody was really paying attention. Do you know what I mean? It's mm -hmm. not like we had this huge hit record. Right. We were able to go out and play those clubs. Um, and of course, I, I, they had to front me because I could, there was no way I could afford to be play a band like that at that yeah. point. But that was when record companies believed in you and they would say, okay, we're gonna front this because we think that there's something there. And and, and we're and and I had all these amazing things, people and uh, happening at a time that that I was just so fortunate. You know, to have the record company I had, to have the manager I had, the producer that I had, the band that I had, um, all supportive of me and encouraging me and and giving me that confidence with each step, with each song we recorded, with each show we played. Um, um, just n knowing that I had this team around me. Somebody had your back. Somebody had my back and my front and my sides and everything mm -hmm. else. Um, and we were having fun. Mm, yeah. You know, and I was learning. I was learning how to make records. Um, and and um, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was great. I mean, I'm still benefiting from uh, having that start, sort of incredible uh, repertoire of people around me. In those early days, did you were you writing songs at that time? I, I had written "Boulder to Birmingham," and uh, that was the only song I'd written <laughs> since um, when I was in New York. Early days, I had had a uh, record contract with um, um, Jubilee Records, uh, um, and um, Mor Morris Levy, who pretty notorious criminal in the music business. It's his record label. Um, and which we had done in like three days and I had written most of the material on it. They're, they're not bad songs. Um, they you know, kind of uh, Joni mitchell sounding melodies and stuff. Because once again, I hadn't, I don't feel I really ever found my voice till I started working with Graham, singing with Graham. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, but no, I, I had not been writing songs. So, um, but I'd written Boulder to Birmingham, which was uh, in response to Graham's death. Who picked your songs in? How, what, was that a thing that you relied on Brian or did you uh, have oh, an input? I, I pretty much have been a song picker. <laughs> I don't pick the guitar, but I'm a song mm -hmm. picker. And um, I, I have a pretty good ear. I think it's from coming through folk music because the lyrics are so important in folk music. Um, but, but we did share, uh, Brian could suggest a song, but basically it, I've, I relied on, on, I'm surrounded, I was surrounded by incredible songwriters, Rodney. I, I knew Towns from, from opening for him in Gertie's mm -hmm. in New York. So I, I was aware of all his songs. Um, so you got uh, kind of first pick, Adam? I got first pick of Rodney for sure. He would play every time when we were living in New York. I mean, in uh, L.A. Uh, in those early days, uh, he'd finish a song and he'd, I'd be the first person he'd play it for. I'd get first crack, and um, and of course he introduced me to a Guy and Susanna, and um, you just sort of create that um, uh, vortex, you know, that 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 songs almost come to, uh, come to you because mm -hmm. you're always searching for them. You're always open to them. And because I wasn't a writer, um, I depended on finding other songs. That never bothered me. I, I, I never thought there was something, you were less of an artist if you didn't write your own material. Didn't bother Kenny Rogers. <laughs> no, and but I do think that uh, there was a point where I did realize that there were certain songs I wanted to write. I didn't want to depend on it. Um, so, um, I think it's good if you can write, but don't, f this idea that everyone has to write all their own material and what people end up doing, I think, is getting together and, and, and there's three or four people writing a song. That to me sort of isn't, that's not that kind of song for me. Uh, 
although I have done some co-writing that I've really enjoyed, but usually it's an excuse to get together with people I really like to spend time with, like Rodney and um, Kate and Anna McGarrigal. We wrote songs together. And, uh, so I, I, I did enjoy that. Hey, we're going to take one more break here. We'll be right back. 